Okay, that's 1201, so we might kick this off. Uh, as I said at the top, this is a Maya grazing event, a panel discussing how Regen Ag enriches the food life cycle. Um, this is a 45 minute event, and we'll stick to that time frame. Um, we're going to have some introductions and a few slides from our panel members to kick us off before we open up to some audience Q&A. So our panel today looks like this. My name's Toby Grogan, I'm from uh, Impact Ag. We are a asset manager, farm manager. Uh, we have 100,000 acres scattered around Australia that we look after and a lot of other countries that we advise. Uh, I am what I call a natural capital specialist in that uh, most of our farms are managed regeneratively and I focus on uh, measuring and monetizing some of that natural capital. Um, we're gonna hear a bit about that today. So our topic today, Regen Ag, how it enriches the food life cycle, um, is we're gonna have a, a, a three different sort of approaches on, on what that looks like, both from a straight uh, monetization point of view and, and uh, adding some additional income into your food production system, uh, focusing on consumers and, and uh, enriching their, their uh, experience of the food that we produce and grazing management and how uh, effective grazing management can improve your production system. So our three panelists today, uh, we're gonna to first hear from Kieran Witter from uh, AgriProve. So AgriProve is a uh, soil carbon project developer and essentially they measure and monetize soil carbon gains in the grazing and cropping environment. So Kieran's gonna to talk to him about that. We've got Steph Trethwaif, Director of Brand and Marketing from Taz Ag Company. Uh, they are a take two plates um, beef business. Steph has a very valuable background in media and communications. Um, and she's gonna give us uh, her insights on what the consumer is looking for when it comes to Regen Ag and how that can enrich her business. And we're going to hear from Bart Davidson, co-founder and chief grazing officer of My Grazing. I uh, like that title. So uh, Bart's going to talk about effective grazing management. And I'd also like to hear from Bart around uh, some of the data that My Grazing's got as a business uh, and how that can be used to put some evidence behind some of the regen ag claims that we, we often hear these days. So to kick us off, Kieran, I might throw over to you, please. Thanks, Toby, um, and thanks to Maya for having me on the panel today. Um, at AgriProve, Agri our goal really is to develop soil carbon solutions and increase the opportunities for farmers by reducing barriers to participation in soil carbon projects under the Emissions Reduction Fund. For us, soil carbon projects are really all about partnerships with innovative farmers, uh, whereby AgriProve wrangles the forms, all the administrative requirements under the ERF, as the soil methodology is one of the most technically and administratively complex under the scheme. Us doing that really allows the farms to focus on implementing their innovative regen practices on the, on the farms that serve to build soil carbon. From our perspective, soil carbon is the scorecard for the health of your soil, and it has the potential to deliver improved farm productivity, improve nutrient availability through increased biological activity, better rainfall, rainfall infiltration and moisture retention. Additional to these benefits, participation in soil carbon projects also has the potential to deliver additional revenue in the order of $50 to $100 per hectare per year for well-performing projects. But it also provides access to carbon neutral markets and provides a proof point for the, the underlying farming system. So next slide, please, Toby. Um, at AgriProve, we have developed a streamlined five-step approach to running soil carbon projects, and this includes a very brief high-level project registration, baseline soil sampling, project implementation. So implementation might be something like improved grazing, grazing management techniques, as an example. Um, we then do repeat sampling rounds and after that carbon crediting. It's a measurement based method. So it is a measured increase in soil carbon between sampling rounds that determines the credits that get issued. So next slide, please, Toby. So we, we're currently working with over 200 farmers in our project pipeline. 
that number is constantly increasing. Um, there's a lot of interest out there in, in what we're doing. Um, conversations with our farmer base have really resulted in the development of a streamlined no regrets approach to project registrations. And part of that is the, our success fee model, whereby if no credits are issued to a project, we won't charge any fees. And, and we do this to really align our interests with the farmer. And it really focuses on developing projects that will succeed and build soil carbon. This model also means that the only cost of the farmers other than the cost of their project implementation are the cost of soil testing. Um, and AgriProof takes on all the costs of monitoring, reporting, verification, and all the audit costs associated with the, with the methodology. Um, it's important to mention too, AgriProof is currently the only carbon project developer to have achieved issuance of soil carbon credits. Um, and that was a process that involved two audits at reasonable assurance level and a really good demonstration of our processes, our internal processes with the Clean Energy Regulator, which really, really gave us confidence in, in what we we're doing. But I guess just in summary, um, regen ag practices such as improved grazing management techniques or mixed species forage crops are really key to the success of our soil carbon projects. Um, and we're always really looking at ways that we can assist our farmer base in project implementation and things around record keeping and monitoring as well. So, Tools like Maya um, provide a really efficient solution to, to these aspects of running a soil carbon project. Um, and with that, I'll leave it there and throw it back to Toby. Thanks, Kieran. Um, just before we go over to Steph, uh, I'd like to hear from you around, you know, you spoke around costs there and, and the fact that AgriProof is absorbing a lot of those costs. In the state. Um, there's been a huge amount of interest this year in soil carbon. Uh, the federal government has put it under the spotlight for generating more carbon credits. But one of the barriers is that cost of participation. Um, you know, what, what is happening? What, what do you think will happen to continue to drive down that cost of participation in, in, a, in a soil carbon project? Yeah, sure. So um, no doubt a lot of you probably picked up on the, the recent announcements tied up with the technology investment roadmap. Um, that came out pretty recently. Um, so there was a lot tied up in that, but, but even before that, to go back a step, um, recently the clean, clean Energy Regulator initiated a pilot scheme whereby they're offering up to $5,000 um, in advance payment to basically assist with the, the costs of the baseline sampling on projects. Um, so at AgriProof, we're offering that to, to all our project registrations at the moment. Um, basically the way that works is there's up to 5k of up to five grand available to pay for the baseline sampling costs. That then gets repaid in credits once they're generated on the project. So it really does open up the, the door to, to getting started on the project. Um, and for a lot of the project sizes that we're dealing with, that, that effectively means there's no upfront costs to, to farmers to, to getting started. So even, even prior to those big announcements that came a bit later, that, that was already in place. Um, but um, I guess to to touch on what did come out of the, the technology investment roadmap, um, probably the biggest thing there was the expansion of the remit of the Clean Energy Finance Corporation and the Australian Renewable Energy Agency to include land, sec land sector activities, which include soil carbon sequestration. And what that does, it just creates a fantastic opportunity to, to develop new funding approaches to, to soil carbon project implementation. Um, so a few other things that were tied up in that were a statement that in, included a stretch goal to reduce costs of soil sampling down to about $3 a hectare. So roughly at the moment, it's around $25 a hectare. So that probably ties into development of new methodologies whereby we're building more of a hybrid uh, model plus measurement methodology. Um, and that is one pathway to really get those sampling costs down. So again, if, if we could get down to that $3 a hectare, then that, that is a significant barrier removed for, for, for participation. Um, and I guess tied into that, um, there's now a commitment from the Clean Energy Regulator to turn new method development around inside 12 months. So that just ties into my previous point. So if, if we're looking at new methods um, to develop that, that can reduce those upfront sampling costs, then, then really there is now a pathway to make that happen. Um, but even at a, at a more grassroots level, um, just a really simple way for farmers to send a message to government um, is to register for a soil carbon project. Um, and in doing so, it's just showing that there's a, a real appetite for, for ongoing support for, for these mechanisms. Um, and, and hopefully that, that remains uh, bipartisan policy, policy support going forward. Um, and I'll leave it there, Toby. Thanks, Karen. Um, 
So we're going to go from someone asking for people to register for soil carbon projects at someone to someone that it has uh, registered a soil carbon project. Before we, I, I go to Steph, just a reminder um, we're to enter any questions you've got into the Q&A um, feature and we will get to them at the end of the call. So over to you, Steph, now, and you're going to talk to Tazag Company and what you're doing from a paddock to plate uh, point of view. Thanks, Steph. Great, thanks Toby and, and thanks to, to Maya for having me. Um, it's nice to have the sort of consumer angle thrown into a webinar like this. I feel like it's it's a real piece of the puzzle that's often missed. And I think as an industry, we're pretty good at, at being in our bubble and thinking you know, on farm and, and forgetting that there's a whole other um, world out there to, to talk about when it comes to the end consumer. So um, yeah, that's, I guess, my, my area of expertise, so to speak. Um, and what, what, we, what we do is we produce uh, grass-fed Wagyu that's farmed regeneratively. Um, we've coined the term beyond sustainable beef um, because as a brand going from paddock right through to the consumer, we believe that sustainable is not enough. And we believe that's where the world's heading in terms of food production is we need to do more. Um, so that's where that beyond sustainable comes from. And um, we're really excited. We're in the final stages of, um, of launching to market um, in January, which is really exciting. And I'll talk a bit more about that later, um, but we might just jump Toby to the next slide and I'll give a quick overview of, of what we're all about. Um, so as I said, we produce grass-fed fed Wagyu. Um, we're based in Tassie, obviously. Um, Sam is a third-generation Tassie farmer who spent, you know, many years on the mainland getting a lot of experience on farm in agribusiness. Um, he co-founded SproutX, um, Australia's first ag tech accelerator program. My journey is a little bit different. Um, I'm not going to pretend to be a farming expert. This is a new world to me, an exciting world, but one that I think I can add a lot of value to. Um, so I spent eight years as a television journalist uh, working across the country for Channel 7, Channel 9, chasing dodgy con men murderers down the street, that sort of thing. Um, so life is a little bit more tame out here. But, you know, the value I bring to the business is from a brand perspective, the incredible opportunity for regenerative agriculture um, and how meaningful it, it will be. Um, and as we know, it is a bit of a ground up movement. It's it's not something that's going to start, you know, top down. It's something where, you know, it's been around for years. It's the old way of doing things, ironically. Um, but it's really exciting to see, um, see it being talked about more. So um, Sam and I run the business ourselves. We're in grind mode. We're a startup. Um, but, you know, we looked at um, starting the business three years ago. and We thought, well, we want to do beef. We want to do grass fed grass feds kind of everyone's been there done that that's not new what's the next thing what's what's the industry and what a consumer is going to be demanding next and that's where the regenerative piece came in and the more we dug and you know pardon the pun the, the more we you know learned about soil carbon and you know I guess you know things like climate change being talked about more and this incredible opportunity to to farm yeah in a, in a beyond sustainable way so um, that's where we sort of fell in love with regenerative agriculture and I know it's quite a big umbrella term. Um, everyone's got different opinions on it. Um, but for us, you know, we've got our blinkers on in, in terms of, you know, we believe in it. We've got our own ways of doing it. We're incorporating our own um, genetics. So we run Red Wagyu, uh, managing the whole supply chain, which is um, quite daunting, but exciting. Um, and we do things like, you know, we registered, we were the first farm in Tasmania to register a soil carbon project through AgriProof. Um, you know, which uses the only system that's eligible under the UN Paris Agreement, which for us, from a brand perspective, from a brand integrity, from what the consumer is going to perceive um, when they try our product and they learn that about us, that was, that was really important to us as a brand. So that's why we went with them. Um, and, you know, obviously we do a lot of things like multi-species crops, you know, we don't use pesticides. Um, Maya grazing has been great. One of the tools that, that we have in our toolbox um, to, to manage our, our grazing and whatnot. So um, there's a lot that we're doing and it's really exciting. Um, so I suppose, yeah, if we, if we do jump to the next slide, Toby, um, just a last sort of recap is, you know, our journey only started last year. So this is quite new. Um, but, you know, as I said, as an industry, there is an enormous amount of hunger for regenerative produce, so much so that, you know, we're on Instagram and Facebook, and that's a big part of our strategy is we actually have been getting the last few months direct messages from chefs, butchers, retailers across the country that have reached out to us um, and asked when our product's available, purely because it's been farmed in a regenerative way. 
So we've not had to go and look for sales leads. They're actually come to us, which is frustrating when you still don't have a product ready yet. Um, but, you know, just to sum up, I think that's a really um, significant, you know, indicator of where the market's heading and where consumers are at. So, yeah, we're really excited. We've got a big few months coming up and, um, yeah, regenerative agriculture, I guess, is, is at the centre of that for us. So stay tuned. Thanks, Steph. Um, you know, you've got direct consumer interaction and, and your consumers, I think you were mentioning, um, you know, you've got butchers, you've got retailers, um, um, you've got direct consumers, uh, as far as I'm aware, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, I'd just be interested to know in those interactions, you know, what's their view of regenerative ag from an, from an awareness point of view? Is it just this the next catchphrase that that they're trying to capture, or do they do they have a view of what it is and isn't? That's a really good question. Um, I think to, to answer it, I think it's their knowledge is pretty poor. Um, you know, regenerative is not really a sexy word as it is. If, you know, I was picking a word, I probably wouldn't pick that one, but that's okay. Um, and look, as an industry, you know, everyone on this call is on this webinar is either involved in regenerative agriculture, interested in it, wants to learn more, skeptic or not. We're kind of across roughly what it is from a consumer point of view most people and certainly all my friends and family in the city and you know had no idea what it was until I started talking about it and I think that's from our perspective as a business that is going to be the biggest hurdle is that education piece to consumers um, you know as I said I know there's a lot of people that don't like it being called regenerative and you know there's a, within the industry there's always going to be some heated debate and that's totally fine but the opportunity is for food brands to use this journey to start educating consumers and you're not going to do that sitting on a farm doing your thing and not participating in in the, the broader picture and so for brands like us that are going through from paddock to plate that's the power of the conversation directly with consumers is every time we interact with someone you know we're really passionate about trying to build some awareness um, of what regener regenerative ag is and you know for us it does come back to soil health so you don't always have to use that term it's about talking to the way that we graze the way that we manage our cattle the way that we you know what multi-species crops are we call it our salad bowl paddocks because again multi-species to the end consumer what does that mean but you start to talk to them in terminology they can understand and simplify things. I think we've got um, a good way of, you know, basically complicating things. And I think consumers are going to jump on board really easy, sexy, you know, concepts that they can actually understand. And that is doing good for the planet. Because let's face it, that's, you know, people pick up a, a you know, packet in the supermarket and, um, you know, they do pay attention to, you know, is it recyclable or is it this and that. We're not trying to feed the entire country with our product. We're, you know, in, in a bit of a niche with Regen Ag, but we believe that's a niche that's going to grow and become mainstream. And I think you look at you know, Netflix, for example, the Kiss the Ground doco, not sure if anyone's checked that out. Um, that's really exciting because while it's, you know, based in America, the concepts are, you know, relatable here and the whispers are now starting to grow and it is becoming more mainstream. I think that's when, that's when things take off. And that's a really exciting um, concept for us, you know, going to the end consumer. Great. That's a, that's a good um, set of insights, Steph, um, someone dealing with the consumer at the coalface or at the, the um, butcher shop. Uh, so thanks very much for that. So keep those questions coming in. Any comments uh, that you see relevant as well? I'll stop sharing my screen when we get to the end of these slides. Um, so, uh, and start to flip through some of those questions and comments. So over to Bart to talk about how effective grazing management improves the uh, feed life cycle. Thanks Bart. Thanks, Toby. <clears throat> um, breath of fresh air there, Stephanie. Um, really uh, interesting the way that you're framing that. Look, um, uh, just in a nutshell here, I, I thought I'd just mention uh, how Maya came to be and some of Steph's points actually remind me that, um, you know, I, I was a consultant. We had a bunch of people in the room that were uh, those that founded Maya Grazing in the first place. And it was really driven by the need to balance timeframes and dollars. And, the, and the, the issue that we found there was that we had one enterprise that was trying to um, generate breeding cattle and basically a, a standard breeding operation um, on the New England and, uh, and elsewhere. And, uh, and on the other side of that, or at the other end of that, 
um, grass-fed finishing cattle to avoid the, the feedlot uh, um, cycle, if possible, to get to this end product that uh, people were telling us they wanted to buy. And that was really hard. Um, it was really you know, fundamentally difficult. And that was before, I think, re region ag was a word coming around. And it was really just about how to um, better manage uh, supply and demand, how to better manage and take the risk out of grass-fed beef production, because it's really difficult. Uh, you know, when we go from seasons of feast and famine. And that's how we then started to think about these horizons of um, time and, and dollars and, and worked out, um, as everybody does ultimately, that, um, um, you know, just the same way that the markets can remain irrational for longer than we can stay solvent, the seasons can stay unfriendly for longer than we can stay solvent when we're feeding uh, animals through um, to meet market demands, for argument's sake, or to maintain genetics. And that's really where Maya was born. It was born out of that need to, to balance those horizons and bring a framework around the decision making so that um, people in the room and in different rooms at, diff at the same point in time could agree on um, the strategy of, you know, of employing um, decisions around stocking rates. So essentially, you know, if you want to flick over there now, Toby, that's how we came to um, build this thing called my grazing, which is essentially dealing with some very specific principles around grazing management, yes, but at the, at the broader level, it's about helping people identify that framework around deciding on stocking rate to carrying capacity at, at the macro view. And then within that, there's a whole bunch of detail, but essentially it's, it's still some of the same things that both Steph and um, Kieran are, are pointing at here is balancing time horizons with dollars with decision-making. And so, yes, we, we spend a lot of time um, relating to uh, you know, the regenerative principles of grazing management um, that are on the screen there from our friends at RCS and the HM community, which is all about um, some very basic things, but which are fundamentally, you know, uh, can be challenging to employ, which is all about planning, monitoring, managing, having data around the decisions that we're making to do with stocking rate, which then flows on into the things that we're talking about here, which is landscape function, which then results in product integrity, changes in quality, changes in supply chain management. In, you know, and there I'm talking about things like, do we need to actually go to the feedlot or can we get around that? Um, and then to some of the specifics around uh, actual grazing itself, you know, the, the essential things like recovery period, um, managing animal performance based on who gets what and when. And I'm talking there about you know, where, where we feed the heifers versus where we feed the cows versus the grass fed wagyu that Steph's um, talking about there. And then overall matching stocking rate to carrying capacity, which sounds so simple, but is really you know, fundamentally challenging because for, for the most part, people don't actually know what the carrying capacity is before they can start to manage the inventory in such a way that the stocking rate is matching that. Today, in this graze, in all grazes, this month, this year, over time, again, it's, it's about those um, frameworks that we have to work within. And it's actually a bit challenging because we're talking about a landscape with a bunch of people trying to run enterprises in a business that does multiple uh, things with multiple um, scales of um, complexity at times, to get a product to the end consumer that Steph's focused on so brilliantly, um, that want to pay a bit more for it because we can't be green if we're in the red, right? And we, we, we constantly need to balance out these different um, competing needs. So my grazing is really all about those principles of regenerative grazing management. And, uh, and essentially it's the interface between the landscape and the product in terms of grazing at least. So um, you might flick a slide there for me, Toby. Um, I thought I'd talk to this actually, just because you know, we are talking about um, linking the, the, uh, the consumer back through the, the product ultimately to, to the land management, because that's, that's where this, you know, where the rubber hits the road here. And, I found, found this is a, a beautiful couple of photos that um, I can talk to personally that is a, a great example of what we're talking about here where um, we've got country that was conventionally run for a, a few decades that um, about this time last year, a bit earlier, actually got absolutely hammered with those incredible fires that ripped through New South Wales, Australia in September and, uh, and annihilated everything at the back end of what was a pretty critical drought. And that particular country, that particular set of paddocks that we're looking at there, 
um, was uh, was country that was put into what we are now going to call you know re regenerative grazing principles with with vigor and with gusto you know so going through those steps that we just looked at um, really getting on top of um, density after making sure that we've got you know animal performance under control after we're making sure that we've got stocking rate decaying capacity under control and recovery and uh, rest for the for the plants and um, I love that photo on the right because it's actually a, a living embodiment of that regenerative component. And if I had to put the stats up there that underpin that, it wouldn't have been nearly as sexy or as enjoyable for folks that are just trying to visualise what we're talking about here. And, and yes, you could have these black and white um, significant changes over periods of time in any landscape if you give it enough rest. But uh, this is one of the things we're talking about, I guess, in that um, for the consumer to really buy into the provenance of this end result, i.e. the beef or the, the lamb or the wool or the rabbits, whatever, what have you, um, th there has to be a story and a narrative under that. And to that narrative, there has to be data. And that's really where we, we spend our time, but we end up talking through the visuals such as we've got here, which really is just about that dance between people, livestock, time and diversity. And, uh, and I won't get bogged in it now, but we really try hard to, to think about stacked ecology and the data that underpins that stacked ecology um, through to how we harvest and uh, in the grazing sense harvesting is obviously all about that bottom picture there in front of us and 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 the framework that we need to have in order to optimize the harvest of grass uh, almost in a mosaic way so that we are working towards those goals that everybody's talking about here which is landscape function that results in more carbon right looks like biden's going to be um the next prez and therefore we're going to have carbon in the news within who knows how long toby not very long at all and I, I can't wait because we're going to get out of this rut that we've been in and it's going to actually become a lot more uh mainstream i hope we'll find out i should have put a ban on talking politics Bart, but you snuck a bit in there i didn't hear the ban so i, I couldn't uh, so uh we might throw it open to some q a um a reminder here for for everyone that um, the panel's details will be shared at the end of the webinar um, and uh, be sent out along with the recording. I might just start with a question for you, Bart. A challenge for you, um, Regen Ag, you know, I think it's, it's rich on claims about what it does do, uh, but the, one of the criticisms has been a lack of evidence. Um, and myograzing is, a collector of data and you've been operating for a while now so so what role you know what does the data tell you if i think of uh regen ag saying we you, you put less into your paddock as part of the regen umbrella from from an input point of view you leave less you leave more grass behind is one of the principles so surely that means you're taking less out um, What's the data telling you and, and, and how do you get that data out to, to sort of start to share with, with people more broadly some evidence behind some of these claims? Sure, Toby. Um, and that was a fairly long question, so I'm trying to remember the start of it now, but I, I think that it was a good question too. Um, and, and the first thought I had that, come, that came to mind as you framed that question was that um, uh, one of the things I like about where we're going with this thing that we're going to call regenerative ag is that it's unlike its predecessors or its former um, evolving self, which I think began with organics, which was all about what you can't do or what you don't do. And that was pretty much the end of the conversation. And I think that was probably why it was always going to be somewhat of a struggle, not that it's dead, but, but you know what I'm saying. And, and I think that evolving out of that is um, this, uh, this evolving line of thought that what do we do? How do we do it? What is the outcome of that? And that's really what we're talking about here. And yes, you're right. We um, we have built a, a tool that is very data centric. And so every minute of every day, 24 seven, um, a, a group of animals in a mob or a herd is being moved from this bit of feed to that bit of feed in, a time, in an event that is a graze, that is on a paddock that at some point has had rainfall and has a relationship to people. And, and ultimately what, what that, um, generates is a is a psychological map of how we think about grazing. Um, you think about it, once you get a couple hundred thousand individual grazers um, where people have had to make decisions around when it starts, when it finishes, how many people are in the party, the grass party, you know, how many animals are going to eat this grass at this point in time, um, 
before they move and then how long before they come back and relationship of that to rainfall, relationship of that to um, um, uh, all things to do with the, the constraints of the farm because we haven't got limitless time, paddocks, um, animals or choices. So the things that we see are essentially that, um, the, you know, and this is, this is the claim that I guess we're going to um, get into a fist fight with a few people over it at some point. But I, I think that, and, and my role in Meyer is to, is to interrogate and, uh, and understand the data. And what's apparent is that you can have your cake and eat it too. And, and I guess that's really um, looking for a fight in some ways, but um, the data would suggest that, um, and, I, and I would say actually that pre things like Meyer, and there are, there are tools out there, this was all in the analog age and there was no way of actually knowing. Right, so now that we've moved from analog to digital, we can say that um, where we get um, sufficient data and and basically um, density goes up, recovery extends, and so we have numbers like, for example, you know, people who plan grazers, people who actually consciously decide who's going to get what and when, whether it's um, a dairy intensity or extensive northern um, northern territory the actual act of planning grazers results in roughly double the recovery, whether, whether it's good planning or poor planning. Over the, the extent of our grazing database, basically those who plan double their recovery period, which means therefore that we've got plants that are getting significantly longer to build their carbohydrate reserves, you know, return to phase two. Um, and not just that, but also um, density, ground cover, um, infiltration I mean, there's a bunch of numbers but basically we focus on the ones that are in that that group of six that i put up a bit earlier and essentially um getting that matrix right and to to, to answer um the, the most common question you know one of the things we see most often is that if you get on top of managing um density and recovery then uh generally speaking somewhere between 50 and 100 dollars per hectare spent on water and wire will essentially pay for the hectare uh, that you would have bought from your neighbour, and the hectare might be worth, um, uh, any, well, it depends on on the country, obviously, but anywhere from so four, five, six hundred dollars per DSC area. So um, those are the things that are consolidating for us, absolutely. And it's that it's the grazing, grazing behaviour, though. It's not just a single, um, you know, e explicit discrete thing over here or a discrete discrete thing over there. It's actually a, a pattern of behaviour that must be encapsulated in a framework that says, you know, this is. This is, the, this is the way that we graze. Long-winded answer to your question, I, I realise. I knew I'd get the long-winded answer from you, but that's all right. I will, uh... um, getting on to some of these questions now, um, I think there's uh, a few questions for each panellist, so I'll try and get through uh, all three of you. Um, Kieran, there's a couple of questions here around, you know, the process of registering with government, why you'd re register with government um, uh, and, and how you'd go about that. So I'm thinking this is a bit of a, maybe a step back for you around what's an ACU? Why do you register with the government? Thanks. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Toby. So <clears throat> I guess as, as it currently stands in Australia at the moment, the Emissions Reduction Fund really is probably the only pathway to, to monetising um, carbon credits generated through, through soil carbon. Um, so really that, that probably answers the question as to, to why you would register. So it comes down to monetizing that natural capital. Um, and in terms of the, the actual crediting, um, the way that works is, is, as I mentioned in the presentation previously, it's a measurement based method. So it's, it's based on the, the measured increase in soil organic carbon stocks. And basically each carbon credit is the equivalent of one ton of carbon dioxide equivalent stored in the ground. So we do all those calculations in the back end to, to determine um, what that comes out as. But um, yeah, really with our approach, there's just, um, it's kind of a no regrets pathway to registration, um, particularly if we can offset those baseline sampling costs, um, then really we try to reduce the risk to, to the farmers in signing up under the ERF as much as possible to, to really um, open up the opportunities to access the, that, that credit market under the Emissions Reduction Fund. What's a carbon credit worth? Uh, spot price at the moment, I think, is around the $15, $16 mark. And you can, $15 of credit, and you can put a few of those in per hectare, you know, rainfall, soil type, all those. 
Yeah, that's right. So, um, you know, we, we have some internal metrics that we apply to any projects that come, come through to us um, and we can run those rough calculations based on things like, as you say, soil type, rainfall zone, um, what the management practice is going to be, whether it's going to be mixed species forage cropping or just a, stand, a, a grazing management approach. Um, and yeah, we can, we can determine roughly um, what we think the potential sequestration rates are going to be based on, on those parameters. Um, so that, that, that's on a project by project, project basis. Okay, thanks, Kieran. Steph, one for you, um, and it's a question around piggybacking off the pack, back of Taz Tag Co, uh, and and whether you would consider um, you know, in, uh, livestock from others franchises. Um, it's a good question given where you are in Tassie with a lot of small holdings, and and you've done all the hard work on a on a marketing piece. Yeah. Uh, what's that look like? Yeah, no, in, in that, thanks for that question. That's um, it's a funny one. I mean, we actually registered the name, the Tasmanian Agricultural Company, a couple of years ago and couldn't believe that the name was up for grabs, to be honest. So um, that was a bit of a win because we sort of, we saw the opportunity long-term, you know, once we get our own beef right, that it could be an umbrella brand for great Tassie produce. Um, so there's no sort of hard answer to that question, but, you know, we're certainly open as a brand is the next 12 months are gonna be critical for us to, to get to market to prove our concepts, to get a consistent product in market. Um, and, you know, we have talked to a couple of other, you know, producers that, you know, might be interested in doing something like that with us and, and collaborating. And, um, you know, I think that's something that in the future we definitely look at because there is a great potential for Tassie in general, um, but also for our brand to, to work with others down the track. But in saying that, Toby, we are in startup grind mode. We have so much to do um, the next sort of six months in particular that it's sort of one of those things that will, will cross that bridge and um, hopefully in a few months time might get invited back and we can talk about you know how great our steak tastes and how great it's going and we'll go from there I think. Thanks Steph. Um, but a couple for you, um, question around you know a farm that doesn't have flexibility in it that that there's constraints that are unable to to result in stock moves every day or every other day you know not every business is, is structured like that so, so what can you do in that scenario where you might be off farm or, you know, there's other constraints that, that mean you're not there every day or, or not able to move stock every day? And, and there's another question around data, which I might throw to you. You've got well, to... it is what it is. And this is one of the things we, we need to be clear on. Um, it's a bit like being a driver. I, I might be a terrible driver um, of my Volvo, but uh, what matters is the scorecard and I take it to the mechanic, right? So. I drive, I drive it the way I drive it. And if I flog it, I kill it. I do well. I, I, I magnify the benefits. I accentuate how I graze it because I'm there 24 seven versus not mixed metaphor. I know bottom line is the data is the data. And if, and, and by that, I mean, if you can't make moves because you're off farm, then you structure that the best way you possibly can. You still have to go through the same principle decisions around um, supply and demand of grass and livestock. And, uh, and who gets what and when, it's just that you're going to have greater or less, less flexibility around recovery levels, density. Um, it's, it's just going to be more difficult, but that doesn't mean that you can't still do it and accrue the data in the process. And whether it's set stocked or uh, multiple moves per day, um, we're still gathering that same information that goes to, as I say, the, the mechanic, and then we'll see what the results of that are. But it's still very beneficial to know what those results are, whether I'm an on-farm or an off-farm observer yep and we've we've said data a dangerous amount today what is data what are you measuring just give us a bit of a run sheet around what what things you're measuring um yeah let's try and keep it simple right i, I guess ultimately there are a bunch of relationships that are going on that most of us carry around in our heads when we're dealing with the farm and that's the rainfall it's uh the group of animals that are in a mob that are grazing a paddock for a day a week a month or a year and then we really want to know the yield of the paddock for a period of time relative to the rainfall, because what you'll find is people go to the pub and say that this country is running X number of DSE or X number of beasts, um, but it's got no relationship to the season. So in Australia and so much of the world, we go from feast to famine, El Nino to La Nina. We need to be factoring in the yield, the grass yield, the dry matter yield per unit of rainfall. And that's really where my focus is. And, uh, um, prior to that, we are we're collating 
um, who ate what by simply knowing that we've, we've um, we being the, the, the farmer, the grazier, we are managing livestock inventory, you know, how many bulls we've got, how many cows we've got, which paddock are they in, and then as they move, they move. It's, um, it's, uh, it's then collecting that data as a result and doing the calcs that would otherwise have to be done in our heads or on paper. And then, we'll, and then okay, there's things like, okay, how long since this grass was last grazed? How long, how many days of the year has it been rested? What was the density of those grazers? And what's ultimately the yield versus what it should be or has been over the long term? And are we improving that long-term carrying capacity? And if I'm the farmer, I'm interested in kilos of beef per hectare. It's one of the things that um, is a big upside for us because we know the actual number of the, 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 the consumption, the demand, and we then over time, we being the, the farmer using migrating, the, the actual kilos of beef that are being produced, we can uh, look at conversion rates. And so one of the, those early um, properties I pointed at, you know, the, the main game there is to keep um, feed conversion rates in the eight to 10 kilos of grass per kilo of beef range. And I've talked about this with um, Sam and uh, Steph's partner, uh, because it's absolutely critical to getting the numbers to work in that type of business. And the fact is that most people don't know. They just don't know. They might and probably do know the kilos of beef being produced. Maybe it's to stock class, maybe it's to enterprise, maybe it's to business. But uh, very, very few will know what the, um, the consumption to achieve that is. And that's one of the things that we, uh, we actually capture um, ultimately. So it's a big area. Toby, I mean, I couldn't tell you how many people end up grazing through winter uh, with animals that go backwards because um, the kilos, per, kilos of grass per kilo of beef or lamb equation is infinitesimal. Okay. And doing the economics on that. Different conversation for a different day. Thanks, Bart. We might have another time for another one or two questions. Um, we've got a question here around the soil key. Soil key being a implement um, that sows mixed species cover crops. So, Kieran, can you talk to what it is and, and why it's important to your business? And I think, Steph, you have used this bit of kit on your farm, so you might be able to talk to performance there. And, and we'll come back to you, Bart, if we've got time around the diversity piece. Thanks, Kieran. Yes, sure, Toby. So, um, the yeah, the soil care unit, um, it's just a seeding system, a minimal disturbance seeding system that allows mixed species forage crops to be, be sown in. And um, it's the, the soil care system that was used on our um, groundscaping project, which was the project that has had the, the accuse issued on it. Um, so that was really the proof of concept for, for the model. So that's, um, that's kind of the importance of the soil care uh, for our business, we do have a couple of them. There's actually, there's one in Tasmania at the moment um, with um, Steph and Sam, as you mentioned, Toby, and we've got another one in the Hunter Valley as well currently. Um, so really what we're trying to do with those is just uh, demonstrate the, the principles in as, as many different areas as we possibly can. Um, but having said that, we're, we're also doing a lot of work with um, other, other seeding systems as well. So really what we're, we're trying to achieve in that is, um, I guess, to, to come up with uh, a recipe um, that, that's going to work in, in a given location. So whether that be a specific mix of seed combined with a, a specific seeding mechanism um, that's going to achieve the best results for the farmer. So that's, that's kind of work in progress for us at the moment and something we're um, putting a, a lot of resource into currently. Thanks, Kieran. Um, we've got one minute to go, so I might just wrap up um, before, rather than go through a couple more of these questions. There's a, there's a group of questions here around the specifics of soil carbon projects and, and the longevity of it and what you're signing up to. So, you know, you'll be able to go direct to Kieran for those um, at the conclusion of the webinar. And there's some more specifics around some of this data piece and the measurement and, and, and the nuts and bolts of my grazing and, and you'll be able to get access to uh, Bart um, with those contact details as well. So uh, thanks very much to all our panelists today, Kieran, Steph and Bart. Thanks to Maya for hosting the webinar. They'll be doing a few more of these over the coming months uh, with the sort of diversity and mix of uh, businesses and views that we've gone through today. So keep an eye out for, uh, for those. So, uh, at this point, we'll probably wrap it up. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you. See ya.
Thanks, Toby. Thanks, folks. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.